I suppose you may have heard Derek when he gave his talk. He's recently argued uh, that we're not human beings, and in fact, he published a paper last year with the title, We Are Not Human Beings. What he means by this is that we're not biological organisms. Okay, there is a human being, a human animal, sitting in your chair, but on Derek's view, that animal is not you. And I'll tell you in a moment what he thinks we are instead. Uh, he's got four main reasons for thinking that we're not human beings. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's not right. No. I've jumped the gun. Okay. Uh, why, you might ask, would anyone think that we're not human beings? Isn't it rather obvious that we are human beings? I mean, when you look in the mirror, you see a human being. And don't you see yourself? Isn't that thing in the mirror you? Uh, and there is, in fact, a rather powerful argument for our being human being, which goes like this. A human being, in most cases, can think and is conscious. Uh, in fact, the human being sitting in your chair seems to have the very same psychological properties that you have. But if human beings think just as we do, but we're not human beings, it follows that there are two thinking conscious beings wherever we thought there was just one. There's the animal thinker and the non-animal thinker. So this uh, talk was, has, has two authors, an animal author and uh, an author that's something else, not a human being. Uh, for that matter, the animal being psychologically just like me would satisfy any ordinary definition of person. For example, Locke's famous definition. Uh, it would be a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same th uh, thinking being in different times and places. So I'm one of two people thinking these thoughts, giving this talk. Uh, in that case, I ought to wonder which person I am, the animal person or the non-animal person. Uh, now, no one would like to say that uh, each of us shares our thoughts with another person, a second person of a different nature from us, uh, but otherwise psychologically indistinguishable. So if we are not human beings, as Derek Parfit believes, that can only be because human beings are not psychologically just like us. They don't share our thoughts. They don't satisfy uh, Lockean definitions of personhood, uh, and so on. But then the question is, why not? What could prevent a normal, healthy human, adult human being from using its brain to think? Uh, now, opponents of the, the, that is the, the, the view that we are human beings or human animals has come to be known as animalism. Uh, those who reject this view, like Parfit, will want to explain why it's not possible for a human animal or a human being to think. <coughs> uh, otherwise, they face a problem, a problem of too many thinkers, so to speak. All right. So uh, that's a good reason to think that we are animals. Now, why would anyone think that we're not? animals. Uh, so now I come back to where I was uh, a moment ago. Uh, Parfit thinks there are three reasons to think that we're not animals. Uh, first of all, our being animals seems to have the wrong implications about personal identity over time, about what it takes for us to persist from one time to another. So uh, I want you to imagine that your brain is removed from your head and transplanted into my head. Okay. The result is someone who looks like me, but who thinks and acts like you, for the most part anyway. Right? Someone with memories of your life, uh, who is convinced that he's you, and so on and so forth. All right. Now, you might ask, uh, as philosophers have been asking for, since the, t the time of Locke 300 years ago, who would this person be? Would it be me uh, with a new brain? and rather confused, a lot of false beliefs about his past, and so on. Right? Or would it be you with, uh, with a new body? Right, with the, with the, the magnificent physique of a middle-aged academic. Or someone else, some third possibility, perhaps. All right? And uh, the most common uh, answer to this question, seemingly on the face of it the most attractive answer, is that he would be you with a new body. He would be just who he thinks he is. Right? Uh, that is, 
what it takes for us to persist through time is some sort of psychological continuity. So, 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 so he would be you because he's got your psychology rather than mine. Okay. And this is the view that Parfit also takes. Uh, but if this is true, if you would go with your transplanted brain uh, into my head, it seems to follow that you're not a human being. All right, and the reason is uh, the, the operation does not move a human being from your head to my head. You, it doesn't pare down a human being to the size of a brain, move it across the room, and then give it lots of new parts to replace the ones that it lost. It seems that the operation rather simply moves an organ from one human being to another. But a thing in itself can never go their separate ways. Right? So you couldn't come apart from yourself. That's just logically impossible. Right? So you've got a property that no human being has, the property that you could possibly go with your transplanted brain. Even though, of course, you're not, none of us is actually going to have a brain transplant, I should hope. Uh, but you could uh, 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 have one, and if you did, you would go with the brain. Okay. But no human being has that property. Okay. So if you've, if you've got a property that no human being has, then you're not a human being, but something else. Okay. This is what I've called the transplant problem. So that's one reason to think that we're not animals. Here is a second reason. This is a little bit more abstract. Uh, this time I want you to imagine that your brain is removed from your head as before, but this time it's not transplanted, but simply kept alive in, a, in one of those vats that philosophers like to imagine. Okay. And uh, philosophers also like to imagine that a brain in a vat would, or could possibly anyway, remain conscious and able to think and so on. Okay, now whether this is true is a disputed question, but I'm going to assume for the sake of argument that it is true, as generations of philosophers have assumed. Okay, so your brain is, is removed from your head, is kept alive and conscious in a nutrient vat. Okay, now the brain in this state is intelligent and conscious and is a person on any ordinary definition of the word. Okay, uh, if you are a human being, a biological organism, this person in the vat is not you, right? Because the, the, the human being has stayed behind with an empty head. Okay, so, the, so, so it's not you. Uh, so where did this brain person in the vat come from? Mark Johnston, who's written a, a, an important paper about this problem, calls it a remnant person, the person in the vat, okay. Where does this person come from? Uh, it seems very unlikely that the operation, well, we don't want to say that, that, that the remnant person was a person already, even before he was removed from your head, because that would imply once again that there were two people sitting there, uh, the, the brain person and the full-sized person, okay, the, the human being. Uh, it seems equally unlikely that, that removing your brain from your head would suddenly make it into a thinking, intelligent, conscious being, Okay, so it seems that the brain wasn't uh, thinking and conscious when it was in your head, uh, nor did removing it from, from, your, from your head suddenly make it intelligent and conscious. It looks like the only other alternative is that the operation brings the remnant person into existence, which is very strange. How could removing uh, one of your vital organs from its natural surroundings create a new person? That seems completely crazy. Uh, More, what's more, this remnant person wouldn't be uh, a human being. Uh, this implies that some human people are not human beings. All right. Uh, but if there's a, a person who is not a human being in this case, you would expect there to be a person who is not a human being in the normal case as well, which is incompatible with the view that you and I are human beings. Okay, so this, the remnant person problem is, seems to be a serious uh, a worry for the view that we are human beings or, 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 or biological organisms. Uh, here's a third reason uh, not to think, to, think, to, th to, to think that we're not uh, human beings, a reason that part of it gives, and this is that this view, animalism, seems to face its own version of the too many thinkers problem, all right? Uh, think about your 
brain now. Now, no more science fiction, right? So, so the, 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 your brain is now in your head in a normal condition, all right? Uh, but uh, is that brain now able to think? Is it now conscious? Well, if Sorry, I said, I said no more science fiction. Now, if it were removed from your head, of course, then we assume that it would be conscious and able to think in the, in the vat, okay? But again, removing it from your head could hardly suddenly give it the ability to think and be conscious. So if your brain would think and be conscious in the vat, it ought to be able to think and be conscious even now in its normal surroundings. Okay, so now, if you're a human being, uh, you are now one of two thinking conscious beings sitting there, right? There's the brain person and the human being person. How could you ever know which one you were? How could I ever know whether I was the small one or the big one? Uh, that's not very nice, okay? Uh, that's a reason to think, perhaps, that we're not human beings after all. And it gives you a hint of what we might be instead. All right, so those are Prophet's reasons for thinking that we're not human beings, roughly summarized. All right, uh, what are we then, if not human beings? Parfit says that there is uh, an obvious solution, as he puts it, to all four of these problems. That is, the too many thinkers problem, uh, the transplant problem, the remnant person problem, and the thinking part or thinking brain problem. The solution is that we are not human beings, but rather parts of human beings. A human being thinks in something like the way that, that, that a locomotive is powerful. Right? The locomotive is powerful by having a powerful engine within it as a part. Okay? Likewise, an organism or a human being thinks and is conscious by having a smaller part within it that thinks. All right. Uh, now, of course, not every part of the human being can think only derivatively by having a smaller part that thinks, else this would go on forever. It can't be that, 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 that the human being thinks by having a smaller part that thinks, and the smaller part thinks by having a smaller part that thinks, and so on forever. Uh, at some point, there has to be something that thinks on its own in a non-derivative sense. Okay. Uh, that part is a person. That's part of its view, as I understand it. Okay. He calls this the embodied part view. I think embodied means that it's a part which is a part of your body within you, rather than in the vat or something like that. Okay. And this proposal makes three, uh, three claims. Did I put these on the handout? No. It makes uh, 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 three claims. First, that for every intelligent organism, a human being, there is just one non-derivative thinker. Okay. Uh, second, that non-derivative thinker is a smaller part of the organism, uh, presumably a brain, okay? And thirdly, that thinker is the person, okay? This is the embodied part view, okay? How does it solve the problems? Well, uh, it solves the, uh, the transplant problem by uh, implying that you would go with your transplanted brain, right? Putting your brain into my head really does move you from your head to my head. It simply changes your surroundings, okay? Uh, likewise, the remnant person problem, uh, the person in the vat is you. Again, uh, all the, op all, all the, uh, 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 the envatment operation does is remove your fleshy surroundings and replace them with uh, artificial life support system. Okay, uh, the thinking parts problem, no problem again. Uh, you are the thinking part. There's only one thinking being here, and, it, and it's the brain, so I don't have to worry about there being a smaller thinker within me. And uh, best of all, it solves the original too many thinkers problem. Uh, I ask, if I'm not a human being, that must be because it's not possible for human beings to think in the way that you and I do. Human beings are just not thinking conscious beings. Why not, you might wonder. Well, Parfit can give an answer. His answer is a human being can't think because it's too big to be a thinker. Right? Uh, it thinks only in, this, uh, uh, only in the derivative sense of having a smaller part that does the thinking. So uh, 
this rather strange sounding embodied Bart view that you are literally uh, a brain and that, that you weigh two or three pounds, uh, absurd though it may seem on the face of it, actually has uh, very important theoretical virtues and can solve some really quite hard problems. So it, it's, 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 it's not completely crazy to, to, to see why Parfit thought that this was such a nice solution to these problems. And I certainly haven't got any, uh, 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 well, I don't think there is any very nice solution to, to, to this problem, but if there were one, this, this would seem to be, uh, to be it. Actually, the embodied part view has in another virtue, which I haven't mentioned yet, uh, and this is, I suppose, another uh, reason why, why you might be worried about uh, the view that we are human beings. Uh, it, there could be uh, a single human being or human organism with two heads or with two brains. Uh, whether this is so in any actual case is disputed, but I mean, there are cases of conjoined twinning in which uh, there is what at least looks like a single human being with two heads and two completely separate mental lives and so on. Uh, and it's tempting to suppose that there are two people in this sort of case, that is two separate thinking conscious beings, each with their own mental lives. Okay, but if there's only one human being there, or one organism, then these two people cannot themselves both be human beings or organisms. Right? At least one of them must be something else, not a human being. Okay, that's, uh, uh, so again, if there could be uh, a human person who was not a human being, th then it can't be true that all human people are human beings or organisms, and likewise, you would expect, well, you would at least wonder why there isn't one of these uh, 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 non-human being people associated with each normal human being as well, okay? Uh, but Parfit can give a nice solution to this problem. He can say that there are two people in the conjoined twinning case because there are two brains there, and those two brains are the two people. <coughs> All right, those are the virtues of the uh, embodied part view. Now, uh, I want to look at it a bit more critically. Uh, and I want to start with the question, uh, which part of the human being or the organism is the thinking part, the conscious controlling thinking part of the organism? Uh, now, maybe we can assume that the thinking part would have to include the brain. It couldn't be my left hand, for example. That, at least, well, that seems a bit crazy. Uh, but for the, as far as that goes, it could, the, the thinking part of, of, of the human being could be its upper half or its head or something like that. Uh, why should it be the brain? Or is it even the brain at all? Or some part of the brain or what? What would settle the answer to this question? For that matter, why isn't the thinking part not the whole organism? Why suppose that an organism thinks by having a smaller part that thinks? There's nothing obvious about that assumption. So this question has to have an answer if the embodied part of view is correct. Uh, Parfit does not venture any answer to this question. Uh, as far as I can see, uh, the answer has to be something like this. Uh, a being thinks in a strict non-derivative sense only if all of its parts are somehow directly involved in its thinking. Okay, so a the reason why a, a, a whole human being cannot think is because it's got superfluous parts like feet and eyebrows and kidneys. These parts are superfluous in that they haven't got any direct involvement in the person's mental activities. Okay, uh, uh, so my feet might play a role in my sense perception, which is a, which is a kind of thinking. Uh, but, right, they enable, enable me to, 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 to feel the ground and so on. But that, but, but, but my feet are involved in my perception only in an indirect way. Okay, so since I'm a non-derivative thinker, it follows that my feet are not parts of me. They're merely parts of my surroundings. Right. 
so a true thinker has to be made up of all and only the objects that are directly involved in its thinking. I think this has to be the assumption behind the view that uh, each organism each, uh, thinks by having a smaller part that thinks, strictly speaking. Otherwise, it would seem to be entirely arbitrary to say that each of us is a brain rather than some other part of an animal or a whole human being. Okay, uh, I've called this claim thinking subject minimalism on the handout. Right? So a true thinker must be made up of all and only the, the objects directly involved in its thinking. Okay, uh, and the embodied part seems to presuppose this claim. Now, I worry about minimalism, thinking subject minimalism. I've got two sorts of worries. Uh, the first worry is, well, is this. I'm not sure whether we can say of every part of a human being, whether it's directly involved in that human being's thinking, or indirectly involved in his thinking, or, uh, or not involved at all. Okay. Uh, I mean, I couldn't think unless my brain had a, a, a regular supply of oxygenated blood uh, and so my heart and my lungs uh, and, so, and, and, and blood vessels are involved in my thinking. They're necessary for it, in fact. But, uh, some, uh, but, but uh, they're not, on Parfit's view, directly involved. So they're involved, but only indirectly. Uh, but why not? Uh, how do we find out which parts of, 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 of the human being are directly involved in its thinking and which are only indirectly involved? Uh, think about other activities that the human being can engage in. Uh, walking, say. So which parts of, of, of which parts of you, which parts of the human being are directly involved in your walking and which are only indirectly involved and which are not involved in your walking at all? How, do we, how, how, how would we even begin to answer this question? Uh, now, presumably, if anything is directly involved in my walking, my feet are, 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 but my feet have got parts that don't seem to contribute to my walking in any way, like my toenails, for example. I mean, my feet might even have parts that hinder my walking. I mean, I, uh, 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 I might have excess water in my feet that makes it really hard for me to walk. Uh, so it seems to follow that only, at best, certain parts of my feet are directly involved in my walking. But again, which ones? Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the excess water molecules in my feet, if there are any, could hardly be directly involved in my walking, it would seem, because they just made it, make it more difficult for me to walk. But which molecules are the excess ones, and which are the ones that belong there? I don't know if there's any way of answering this question. Yet, clearly, some water molecules have to be directly involved in my walking, if anything is. And, of course, the brain, too, can have excess water within it, which hinders its, uh, its functioning. Uh, now, I doubt whether there is any principled way of saying which molecules are directly involved in my walking and which ones are not, which ones are only indirectly involved or not involved at all. And the reason is not just that some molecules seem to be sort of on the borderline between directly involved and only indirectly involved. Uh, it's not that, I'm not that I know which ones definitely are and which ones definitely aren't, and some I'm not sure about. It's that I don't, uh, there doesn't seem to be any principled way of drawing a line, even a vague line, between those that are involved and those that are not involved. Uh, and what goes for walking seems to go equally for other activities like eating or sleeping uh, and all the other things that you might do, reading. Right? Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, now, uh, and this le leads me to worry that the same is true for thinking. There's just no principled way of saying which parts of a human being are directly involved in its thinking and which ones are only indirectly involved or not involved uh, at all. Now, it may be, of course, that thinking is different in this respect from walking or eating. Maybe there is some principled way of saying which of the atoms making up a human being are directly involved in its thinking, but I don't know what it is. 
all right. That's my first worry about, uh, about minimalism. Here's my second worry, okay. Uh, even if, suppose there really is an absolute distinction between those atoms uh, that are directly involved in my thinking and those which are not directly involved. Okay, suppose the first problem is solved, or the first worry is not really a worry. Okay, uh, if some things are directly involved in my thinking generally, then some things will also be directly involved in specific mental activities. Right, so some, some of my molecules will be directly involved when I imagine people's faces. And certain molecules will be directly involved when I try to remember people's names. Okay. Uh, but these are very unlikely, unlikely to be the same molecules, given uh, 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 the way in which the brain works. At least we, we don't know very much about how the brain works, but we do know that different parts of the brain uh, uh, seem to be active uh, during different cognitive tasks. Right? So remembering and imagining are almost certain to involve different parts of the brain. Okay, so the molecules directly involved in my imagining faces will be different from those that are directly involved in my trying to remember the names of people. Okay, and it looks like if there's any reason to think that a true thinker has to be made up entirely of objects directly involved in its thinking, if that's right, that looks like an excellent reason uh, to suppose that a true imaginer or true rememberer must be composed entirely of objects directly involved in its imagining or its remembering. Okay, so if this is right, then each human being contains within it uh, a non-derivative imaginer and a non-derivative rememberer. Okay, and because these objects will have different parts, because different atoms are directly involved in imagining and remembering, they'll be different beings. Okay, so the being uh, within me that imagines people's faces will be different, a different being from the one who uh, tries to rem remember people's names. And there'll be st uh, 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 still a different being who thinks about metaphysics and a different one still who uh, uh, remembers last summer's holiday and so on and so forth. Uh, it's unlikely that any part of, the, of, of a human being could have more than one thought or more than one type of thought anyway. Okay, so the thing that imagines faces will, will, will be either too big to remember the names of people uh, by having parts not directly involved in remembering, or else too small uh, by not including some of those parts, or both, which is more likely, I suppose. So what we take to be a person able to perform all sorts of mental activities would really be just a, a, a sort of colony of lots of specialist thinkers, one able to, th to remember, one able to imagine faces, one able to uh, think about philosophy, and so it would go. Uh, if Locke is right to say that a person is by definition both intelligent and conscious or self-conscious, then there would be no people. There couldn't be, right? Because of, n n n there couldn't be any being able to perform more than one kind of mental activity. Okay. Or at least there couldn't be any human people. There could, God could still be a person, say. Or the, the, you know, uh, uh, any, the angels, perhaps, could still be people, but not. There couldn't be a person. A, there couldn't be a human person. Okay. Because of the uh, 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 specialized activities of the, of, the, of the human brain, right? So the worry is this. Uh, if a true thinker could only be made up of just those parts of a human being directly involved in his thinking generally, that, looks, that, that seems to lead to the thought that actually uh, a true rememberer could be made up only of objects directly involved in its remembering, and a true imaginer could only be made up of, of objects directly involved in its imagining. And it follows from that that no being could both imagine and remember. Okay, that seems to be a completely crazy view, or at least very implausible. Uh, anyway, certainly not what Parfit had in mind. Okay, he's got some strange views, but not that strange. Goodness, yes, let's not go there. So uh, that's one worry that I've got. And 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 if thinking subject minimalism is not true or doubtful, then the embodied part view is w w w will inherit that doubt. All right since it presupposes that, that principle.
Okay. Uh, I don't really know how to resolve these uh, 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 these worries. So I'm, I'm very skeptical about about minimalism, and thus I'm, I'm skeptical about the theoretical basis behind the embodied park view. Okay. But without some solution to these worries, uh, I think the embodied park view is just not. Uh, 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 how should I put it? Um, mm. Well, insofar as you've got the worries that I've got, you ought to be very worried about the embodied part of you. <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's another sort of sort of worry about uh, about part of you. This one is a bit easier. Uh, suppose all these worries are. Uh, 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 are resolved, um, the embodied part view seems to have very implausible count, c consequences about our old friend personal identity over time. So uh, imagine uh, that, uh, I'll, I'll use myself as an example this time, so imagine that, that, that after my death, not yours, okay, after my death, uh, 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 the surgeons take my brain from my head and put it into a jar of formaldehyde to fix it, okay, and they keep it in the lab as a fine medical specimen for a study. Okay. Now, it looks, as, it, lo it looks as if my brain would still exist in this condition. That's what anybody would say anyway. That's Olson's brain. Okay, third on the left. Uh, now, it, I mean, fixing a brain in formaldehyde seems to be a way of preserving it and not a way of destroying it. It's keeping it in, in, a, in existence. Okay. Uh, the brain in the jar seems to be the brain that was previously in my head. Okay. Uh, but if my brain would exist in the jar, and I am my brain, then I would be in the jar. So I could become a specimen in formaldehyde. Now, this is not very plausible. It, I mean, I, it, it would be a sort of joke, I think, just to, 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 to point to the third brain, brain on, on, on the left and say that that's also an author of the human animal. Uh, or at least not, except that you, you, you would say that only in a way that you would point to a picture of me and say, that's also the author of the human animal. It, it couldn't be literally true, it seems, anyway. Uh, what's more, uh, now I don't know, know very much about, I'm, I'm actually very skeptical about these sorts of intuitions about, 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 about where you would go in various circumstances, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, this consequence is incompatible with Parfit's view of personal identity, uh, his view that uh, we persist by virtue of some sort of psychological continuity. Right? There's no psychological continuity between me, uh, the philosopher, and the brain in the vat. That would, sorry, the brain in the jar. <laughs> okay. Uh, if I am my brain, then I could persist without any psychological continuity at all. Okay. And for that matter, leaving aside uh, gruesome thought experiments, uh, it's clear that if I am my brain, uh, there was a time uh, when I was uh, 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 in the room when my brain had no mental capacities at all, when it was not yet wired up uh, uh, to support thought. Okay. So that if I am my brain, then there was a time when I persisted through time without any psychological, con psychological continuity as a developing uh, fetal brain. Okay, so this is incompatible with what Parfit wants to say about our identity over time. And uh, you'll remember uh, the principal objection to our being human beings was that this view was incompatible with the psychological continuity view of personal identity over time, right? Why suppose that putting your brain into my head would give you a new body rather than me a new brain? Well, because that person uh, would be psychologically continuous with you and not with me. Uh, if that thought is wrong, as the embodied part view seems to imply, then the main objection to our being human beings falls away. Okay, so everything that Parfit has ever said over his entire career about personal identity over time rules out my existing uh, in a jar of formaldehyde as, 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 as a specimen in a, in a, in a museum. Okay. Uh, so given that my brain could exist in formaldehyde, it has to follow that I'm not my brain, okay. uh, but something else. Now, what could this something else be? Uh, now, Parvat doesn't actually 
say, he's rather evasive about this, but when he, when, when he gets to the part where he says what we are if we're not human beings, he doesn't quite say that we're brains. He says we are the thinking, uh, uh, the, the conscious thinking controlling parts of human beings, and he suggests that we're no bigger than brains, but he doesn't quite say that we're brains. He says some things that, that, that are not very clear. Uh, at one point he says something suggestive. He says that uh, the person stands to her brain as an animal stands to the animal's body. Right? That's not very clear, is it? Uh, the thought here is that uh, an organism is something different from its body, right? So the atoms that make up an organism, a fish, say, uh, also make up a second material thing that's not an organism, not a fish, but rather the fish's body. Okay, this object is just like the fish while it's alive, but presumably when the uh, when the fish dies, it ceases to exist, but its body continues existing, something like that, right? So, so, so the fish's body is just like the fish physically, biologically, while it's alive, okay, but it can outlast the fish. The fish will vanish from the scene when it ceases to function, uh, it's, the fish's body will continue existing. I think this, this must be what Parfus got in mind, okay, not a completely wild thought. Uh, presumably the same goes for trees and fungi and bacteria and other organisms. So what we call a dead tree is something that was not ever a living tree, but rather the tree's body. Okay, it's a bit strange, but uh, if this is right, then there might be, just, just as there are two things in the fish tank, the fish and the fish's body, there are also two things in my head, if there's my brain, and something else. Okay, so th th that is, there's something that... Sorry, there's, there's, so to speak, the, the, well, there's me, right? And there's the thing that stands to me as the fish's body stands to the fish. So there's something that could outlive me if the brain so stopped functioning. Okay, so, so the idea is there are two brain-like objects. They're made of all the same atoms, the same matter. There's the brain, uh, which could exist in a jar of formaldehyde after it stopped functioning. Okay, and there's something else, which is an, an analogous to the, to the organism, right? Uh, which would cease to exist if the brain stopped functioning and could not end up in the jaw. Okay. Uh, you might call this thing the functioning brain because it can only exist for as long as the brain continues to function. Okay. Uh, something like that. Okay, and likewise, uh, uh, what, 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 when I was this big in my mother's womb, or maybe, maybe, maybe this big, okay, uh, and my brain wasn't yet able to support thought or consciousness, uh, the brain was there, but not the functioning brain, right? So I came on the scene later on, only when the brain began to function, okay? Um... Right, okay, so I think this is what he means. So there's the brain and there's the functioning brain, which is something different, and they could come apart, right? The, uh, the brain could outlast the functioning brain. If my brain goes into the, goes in, goes into the jar, uh, the brain continues, the functioning brain ceases to exist. Okay, that would, would seem to be consistent with what he wants to say about what it takes from, for, for me to persist through time. Okay, now, uh, this is also a view that worries me in a number of ways. Uh, one obvious question is whether there are such things as functioning brains, in addition to brains, okay? Uh, are, why suppose that there is not just a brain in my head, but also something that's, uh, 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 that shares, that's just like the brain, except it's got different modal properties. That is, it's got different properties about what could happen to it. Uh, I mean, you can't simply take the physical properties of any ordinary object and, and combine them with an arbitrary set of modal properties and get a description of a real object, I don't think. Uh, I mean, consider the claim that there's such a thing as, n never mind my functioning brain, suppose there was such a thing as my waking brain, 
Okay, a thing just like my brain, except that it can exist only as long as I'm awake, because it is awake. Okay, so that when I fall asleep at night, my waking brain vanishes, it goes out of existence. Okay, re possibly replaced by a sleeping brain. Okay. Uh, uh, when I wake up in the morning, uh, my waking brain returns to being, uh, my sleeping brain perhaps vanishes. Uh, now, I can see no reason to, to believe in the existence of functioning brains. It is an equally reason to believe in the existence of waking brains. And if there are waking brains, there are probably also things just like brains, except that they are, can only exist when they're thinking about philosophy, or only when they're sober, or only when they're north of the equator, or only when they're in London, or whatever. Okay. Uh, now, that sounds like an extravagant piece of metaphysics, to say the least. Uh, worse, it seems to raise another problem of too many thinkers. In fact, it raises a too many thinkers problem that's infinitely worse than the one that uh, the embodied part view was supposed to solve, supposed to avoid. Right? So if there's any interesting connection between a thing's mental properties and its underlying physical properties, then we should expect physically identical objects in the same circumstances to have the same mental properties. Okay, so uh, 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 if my functioning brain is conscious and able to think, then my waking brain and my sober brain and, 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 and so on ought to be exactly as conscious and intelligent as my functioning brain, since they're, since they're physically exactly alike. Okay. Uh, and again, if my functioning brain is a person in Locke's sense, then my waking brain and my sober brain will be people as well. Uh, so there will actually be a vast number of people, perhaps an infinite number, uh, in my head right now. And how could I ever know which one I am? Now, maybe there are functioning brains but no uh, essentially waking brains, no sober brains, none of those uh, 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 silly objects that I was thinking of. Uh, I don't know why this should be, but suppose for the sake of argument that, that there's, there's a brain and a functioning brain and nothing else in my head, okay, apart from the, the, the parts of those objects, the, the, the cells and the, and, 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 and the atoms and so on. So only one, sorry, only two uh, brain-sized, brain-shaped objects here, the brain and the functioning brain. Some, somehow we can rule out uh, the unwanted candidates, okay, somehow or other. Even so, there's my brain. Uh, why can't my brain think? If my functioning brain can think, why can't my brain think? They're physically identical, they've got all the same neural properties, they have the same education, the same teachers, they have, they have the same evolutionary history, uh, the same surroundings. There's nothing, it seems, that could explain why uh, the functioning brain could think and the the ordinary brain cannot think, or at least it's very hard to see what the explanation could be anyway. Uh, this looks like another version of the thinking parts problem that Parfit thought that he had solved. That is, the, the, the thought was, well, how do I know I'm the human being and not the thinking brain? Well, here the problem is, how do I know I'm the functioning brain and not the, and not the ordinary brain that thinks? Right? Uh, now, Parfit will need to say that the functioning brain is the only part of the human being that can think non-derivatively. And he, he, he has to say that the brain itself thinks only in some derivative or second-rate sense. Right? So the brain thinks, the ordinary brain that is, thinks only by virtue of its relation to the functioning brain. Uh, but again, how could there be two physically identical objects in the same surroundings, one of which can think and one of which cannot think? Uh, at any rate, he can't, sorry, uh, right, the, 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 the thinking part view is supposed to imply that a human being uh, can't think because it's got parts that are not directly involved in its thinking. All right. So a, a human being can't think because it's got these superfluous parts like eyebrows and so on. But that can't be the reason why the brain can't think. The ordinary brain that is the one that could end up in a jar of formaldehyde. 
So he can't solve this new thinking parts problem in the way that he wanted to solve the original thinking parts problem. Okay, by saying that the brain can't think because it's got parts not directly involved in its thinking. Uh, he also can't solve it in the way that he wanted to solve the original thinking parts problem by saying that I am my brain, uh, since uh, saying that I am my brain is incompatible, yeah, has, has the wrong uh, consequences about our identity over time. Right, nearly finished. So, uh, so I think this, the embodied parts view for all of its virtues uh, rests on this thinking subject minimalism, which is a highly dubious metaphysical principle at best. Uh, it also seems incompatible with uh, Parfit's view of personal identity over time. Uh, if we try to, try, to, try to change the view to avoid the uh, identity over time problems, that is the, 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 the brain and formaldehyde problems, uh, we seem to get, we, we seem to, uh, this raises a new version of the thinking parts problem that we were supposed to uh, 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 get around in the, in the first place, as well as relying on this uh, rather mysterious metaphysics of uh, thinking brains, sorry, functioning brains and ordinary brains and, and, and waking brains and so on and so forth. Uh, so what options are, are left? What, what, uh, what's profit going to do? Or what, what is someone going to do who wants to solve these problems that, uh, 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 that, that profit wants to, to solve? Uh, one option is to say that my brain doesn't have all the same parts as my functioning. Brain. So the functioning brain is a part of the brain, okay? Not a spatial part, but rather a temporal part. And I, I wish I had a board now so that, so that I could make a diagram, but you have to imagine uh, a sort of ex an object extended through time. That's the, that's the brain, okay? The functioning brain is a, it, 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 it is a subsection of this longer object, okay? It comes into being later than the brain does, right? The brain comes into being uh, 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 in the early stages of fetal development. The functioning brain comes into being later. Uh, at the end of my life, when my brain gets put into the jar of formaldehyde, the uh, brain continues, the functioning brain comes to an end. Uh, that means that the functioning brain is smaller than the thinking brain, that is temporally smaller. It's uh, the, it, it, uh, uh, the thinking, br sorry, the, the, the brain has got temporal parts that are not parts of the functioning brain. Okay. Oh, you might say that my functioning brain is the object made up of all those temporal parts of my brain that function in the appropriate sense, or something like that. Okay. Uh, that would make it an object different from my from uh, my brain. Okay. And you might take this thinking subject minimalism to apply to temporal parts as well as spatial parts, and say that uh, a thinking being has to be made up of all and only the temporal parts of a brain that are directly involved in its thinking. Okay. Uh, so in that case, uh, you could say that my brain cannot think for much the same reason as a human organism cannot think, because it's got superfluous parts not directly involved in its thinking. Okay. That would solve the thinking parts problem. Uh, though it would still retain the commitment to this thinking subject minimalism. Uh, this sort of view has been defended by Hud Hudson in his very nice book, uh, uh, what's it called again? Uh, Materialist Metaphysics of the Human Person, okay. published about 10 years ago. Uh, however, uh, Parfit, over his 40-year uh, uh, career, has consistently uh, 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 declined every opportunity to endorse an ontology of temporal parts. Okay. The view that ordinary objects have got temporal parts is highly controversial. Uh, Parfit has never been happy with this view, uh, never even discussed it as far as I know. So I, this is not uh, <coughs> what he wants to say. Um, another option is to say that we are just brains, okay, and accept that we could become specimens in formaldehyde. Uh, this would require him to change radically his, the, the view about personal identity over time that he's been defending since, the 19, since, since uh, 1970 or so. That's another option. Uh, 
A third possibility would be to give up the view that we are material things at all, say that we're not, uh, we're not parts of organisms, we are rather immaterial things, souls, so to speak, immaterial substances of some sort. Uh, that would enable him to, to, to retain his views about identity over time, it would seem anyway. It would also give him an ex, uh, a way of solving the other problems. Uh, he could say, he could explain why human beings cannot think and why the brain that goes into the jar cannot think. And the reason would be that they are material things. It's impossible for a material thing to think and be conscious. Only an immaterial thing could think or be conscious. Uh, Descartes and Leibniz uh, and Plato, I suppose, uh, have uh, given views, uh, sorry, given reasons uh, or arguments for views like this. That's an option. Uh, I'm <coughs> confident that uh, Parfit will be unhappy, uh, politely decline this gift. But it's, 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 it's perhaps no worse than what he's actually said. Uh, alternatively, he could say that we are human beings after all. Thank you. <laughs>